What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Retro Hoop Collectibles. I have a very interesting video to do today. Um, shout out to my man Dan, who uh, who sent me this this uh, this video uh, a couple days ago. It's a very interesting interview that was done. <clears throat> with uh with nat turner um by a channel called poke knowledge cards um i'm gonna link all the stuff in the description i'm gonna link his channel i'm gonna link the video itself if you want to go watch it in its entirety um he did an interview recently a live interview with nat turner um and there was a lot of stuff uh that was talked about but I wanted to grab a few key points that I felt were relevant. Uh, there was a lot of Pokemon talk, obviously, right? Because that's it's, uh, Poke Knowledge's main, uh, uh, obviously, ma main main discussion is, is Pokemon. Uh, so, obviously, uh, Pokemon being half of the output of PSA, um, you know, Nat Turner took some time to, uh, to talk to... Um, uh, to talk to the Pokemon community, answer some questions and whatnot. And he had a pretty successful live. I think at one point he was saying they had like over 300 people uh, in the live stream. So a lot of people watching. But I wanted to um, touch on a couple of points that really, really kind of hit home for me in terms of uh, in terms of PSA and uh, kind of some of the issues that I've always had with PSA and some of the things that even I myself was, you know, chastised about. Uh, throughout, you know, my making videos and, and, and bringing up things that I was seeing. And there was a lot of people that were telling me I was crazy. But, you know, there's just sometimes you just can't ignore, um, you know, consistent patterns in the way things are happening. So um, but he, he th and, and so two things I want to establish before we before we, we even get started. Number one, um, just I, I want to congratulate Poke Knowledge um number one for having the interview that's that's great uh, I, nat turner is an amazing uh, is, is, a, is a massive titan in the in the industry let, let's not you know mince words about that um but i think he did an amazing job of talking to nat i don't know if he's ever had uh previous conversations with nat or if this was the first time he's ever talked to him but um i think he did a great job of interviewing him talking to him getting information asking really great questions um, and then he, you know, obviously from a, from a Pokemon TCG side, he, he was really getting some good information for him from him. Uh, I don't know much about his channel. He seems to be a pretty good steward of the, uh, of the genre of TCG. Um, but I really enjoyed the, the interview. So I don't know if, you know, I'm tagging him in it, so I don't know if he's going to watch this, but, uh, just a, a, a great job overall in the interview. So I, I highly encourage you guys to go watch it and and subscribe to his channel because i watched a couple of other videos after that and he, he he does a really good job of um does a really good job with his content anyway um the other thing nat turner i have been hypercritical of him uh in the past maybe sometimes a little unfairly but um i want to i want to be clear that he is a huge influence on the hobby as a whole and You'll hear a little bit about this tomorrow in the podcast because JD and I talked about it. But, you know, some of the things that, that he has said in the past or some of the things that he has done in the past, I've always kind of had some issues with. And uh, But one thing I will say about this particular interview or this interview in particular is one of the things that I'm really starting to respect from Nat is his... I guess openness and, and sometimes to a fault, but his openness and his just genuineness when it time when uh when he comes to uh, having conversations he seems to I, I i've oftentimes um not wanted to have people on uh because of the way that they talk they seem to be reading off of a teleprompter especially when you start talking about ceos owners of companies and things like that they always seem very pitchy and like they're just kind of reading from a teleprompter uh or cue cards or something like that they have very um, you know, gathered, you know, general responses that seem to circumvent the question itself. Nat 
in this particular interview has done a really good job of answering questions like head on. Um, and, and that's the kind of openness and uh, the kind of transparency that I've always wanted to see from PSA. Um, and, and maybe Nat has always been that way, but I guess, we, you know, given, given the topic, it's, it's always been a little, a little weird, but <clears throat> I, I wanted to, preface that first because uh, you know like I said I've always been r relatively critical of, of Nat and 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 mainly critical of PSA but I wanted to put that out there before we kind of get into the to the specifics um, the first thing that I want to get into is probably the most important part and this is something that I've 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 always had an issue with PSA about is the, the consistency in their grading right um, it seems that over the last 12 to 18 months, there has been a change in the standards of how you grade or how they grade. However, the standards on their website has not changed, right? So that they're, you know, and I've said this, I've been saying this for months that something has changed at PSA that, you know, and part of what I've been saying now, is Now, let that, me ask you a question. Um, they, they've either tightened up or loosened up. I, I don't know. Something's changed. And Poke Knowledge asked this very question. So I'll, I'll jump into this little piece here of the, of the interview. I want to ask you a little bit about pack grading because I know you've talked about you're real big. You, and on sports, you guys call it wax. In Pokemon, we're super stubborn. We call it foil. We're super <laughs> semantics at this point. But I know you're big into wax grading. Now, one of the, this is where we're getting like down into the weeds and like the speculation. Has PSA changed their pack grading standards? Because it seems like some of the packs that have been graded recently have become a little bit harsher. Like in the past, no one kind of knew even what a PSA 7 or PSA 6 graded pack even looked like. Like it was only 8s, 9s, or 10s, but now we're starting to see those lower grades. You're talking about foil or wax? Foil, yeah. Yeah, we haven't changed the standards. I'll tell you, we, we take foil pack grading. And by the way, I collect most of the packs I collect are foil packs, like 90s basketball foil okay. packs. Um, so I have a full appreciation for it. I just got back in order and yeah, I got like, you know, I think I submitted 50 packs from 1997 tops Chrome. And I think the highest I got was, an, I got like two nines and most were eights and sevens. I think we're just taking it very seriously. I mean, I don't think the standards have changed. I think we're just being, you know, we're applying the standards maybe more consistently, you know, than before. Um, you know, so I don't think the standards have changed. We're just applying the standards more consistently than before. Now, I'm trying not. I'm trying not to let that statement get to me so much. But coming from the CEO of Collector, which is the owner of PSA and the owner of Golden, the owner of all these other subsidiary companies. That's a very big statement for him to be making. So what does that mean? Now, to be fair, in the rest of the comment, I, I kind of feel like he realized what he said. And multiple times after this, he, he, he said, you know, we haven't changed anything. We haven't changed. Like he, he almost tried to like, I don't want to say backpedal a little bit, but I think he kind of realized what he said in that statement. Um, and he kind of tried to make it seem like he, everything's still the same, but it's not, I mean, we all, we all see it, right. We see it on the YouTube, the breaks, the openings, the, 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 the grade reveals and all that stuff. There's something, something has changed. And his response to that was, well, we haven't changed our standards clearly because you can still see that they're the same on, on the website. Um, but he did say, we're just holding to them tighter, right? We're really taking them serious. Okay. So. At what point did they start taking them serious? And at what point were they more loosey goosey, right? This is the problem with, with PSA, in my opinion, is that you don't know what level of consistency you are getting or what level of adherence to their own standards you're getting when you send a card in, right? They're doing that now, according to him, but what were they doing before? And at what point did they loosen up that standard or has it always been loose? Right. I mean, 
you look at a PSA card, there's a serial number on it. At what point in that serial number life cycle did they tighten up the standards? At what point did they loosen the standards? And at what point did they tighten them back up again? The problem with that leads into the next scenario that he talks about, which which he talked that they were talking about strong versus weak tens. And there's a little bit of obviously that there, there's some some uh, give or take there. That, that there's some some flexibility there within the standards of a ten that that can allow for a weak ten or a strong ten. I just that 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 comment or that conversation about strong versus weak tens happened after this conversation about grading consistencies not being correct. Or, or, or being held to a little tighter now for some reason. Um, I, I'll I'll, I'll kind of let this play out. Like you see the I appeal stuff, you know, I know there's other things being out, you know, NBA and others anyway in the market. Um, you know, 1% or top 10% of the tens we designate as being perfect or whatever. Not something where... So he, he so Poke Knowledge asked Nat, hey, I heard that you guys are toying with the idea of adding like a black label pristine or a gold label perfect you know something like that uh and this this is his we're thinking concept. about launching but you know again like in a hypothetical academic approach yes that is absolutely something you could do with the higher pop tens if you wanted if people had a desire to distinguish between them we see it happen anyway in the market um okay. You know, like you go on eBay, you go on wherever heritage, et cetera, like you will see the better ones sell for more than, you know, in the same grade. Yeah. Those strong um, versus weak tens. Yeah. You see it all the time. Yeah. And like, you see the eye appeal stuff, you know, I know there's other things being out, you know, NBA and other stickers, like we're kind of letting the market decide, you know, that for now, I don't think we want to be in the business, as you said, of like, is there a better 10 or whatever? And, and yeah. PSA no, I, I'm hoping you guys don't ever go that <laughs> yeah. way, but I've heard you in other lives mention them. Like, Man, oh, look, we're, like we're always, we're open to innovating and, and, you know, mixing things up. I mean, but we're very thoughtful about doing any of that stuff. Um, we're very aware that we have tens of millions of cars out there that have already been graded. And, you know, the last thing we want to do is affect the value yeah. of things out there. So um, unless it's extremely warranted, you know, for future hobbyists and collectors. Uh, but again, it's not something we're doing. So, I mean, yeah. so a couple of things there, weak versus strong tens, again, based on their standard, I can understand how there's some ambiguity there and there's a little bit of flexibility. Um, I like the fact that he said, um, you know, we're, we're not in the business of, of doing that. We'll let the market decide that, right? Based on, you know, there's already, like he mentioned, some other organizations that are kind of labeling stronger versus weaker tens. Um, based on their standards, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but one of the things that he mentioned was like, hey, we did talk about doing that, but we're not going to do that because we don't want to screw over anybody else that has already had you know, that, that we're, we're hyper aware that there's tens of millions of cards out there that would be affected by any decision that we make going forward. Right. But the thing is, is that he's already done that by the grading consistency adherence comment that he made earlier. Right. Like whether he knew it or not, like that was a big comment for him to make. Weak versus strong tens. That's something that I understand, like you can play with based on the standard. Um, but you know make no mistake they're, they're look they're not necessarily looking to innovate in terms of what's right for the hobby he said it has to be absolutely essential to the to the future hobby otherwise we're not going to screw over our customers no matter how wrong we were right or, or no matter how incorrect our standards are or no matter how much we feel we need to innovate for the sake of moving the hobby forward it has to be essential, right? Like it has to be. So, you know, kind of take that for what you will. But the other point that he made in here, and we'll jump to this, was, uh, you know, AI is such a buzzword, especially when it comes to grading. And Poke Knowledge asked him about that. Uh, Nat did say that they they are not, they will never go to a fully automated grading, um, but that there are certain aspects that they do 
or that they do currently use. And this has always been something that I thought was interesting because of the amount of volume that they're putting out. Um, I've always felt that they had to have moved to some sort of automated grading at some point. Uh, and, and, and Nat talks a little bit about that. That's just been, for anybody who like sells on eBay and stuff to be able to just go right to that card, look up the certain number or just go right yeah. to your submission, have all those cards right there, have like the high res photos front and back. That's been a godsend to a lot of people out there. Yeah. Well, one thing we will do, and I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, we're, I've talked about this before. I mean, we intend to have more and more information available on that cert lookup page. Um, you know, things like you can imagine like where we are adding like date graded. It's just, it's hard, believe it or not, when you have like 30 years of databases, you have to figure out how to combine and pull from. And, but that's an example. Another example could be centering, you know, like we have, we actually do automate the measurement calculation of centering. Oh, okay. um, people don't really realize that, but, you know, yes, we have graders looking at it and confirming, but, you know, we do have a AI system, if you will, that detects centering and, and, you know, that's something I could see us putting on the, you know, as metadata on a verification page. Like, you know, if you're curious, you don't want to pull the ruler out yourself. Oh yeah. It's 58, 42 left, right. You know, great. Oh, that would be real interesting. If so again, this is something that way back in the day when, the folks from TGT, Transparent Grading Team, if you guys remember that. Um, they, one of the things that I always felt was interesting at the beginning of this whole discussion about AI grading and all this stuff was that, in my opinion, there were some things that are pretty, they're, they're pretty finite, right? It's either centered or it's not. It's either a 90 degree angle corner or it's not, right? And then, you know, th those are numerical things that can be measured. And I've always kind of felt like that was an aspect of technology that could be used. And it sounds like that's what PSA is doing, which is which is good to see. Uh, I think this this is the first time at least I've ever heard him, um, you know, acknowledge and and uh, and actually, you know, confirm that they are using some automated. I'll, I'll throw it up in quotes, AI, right, to 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 do some you know, to, to, to help and to aid in the grading process. He goes on to talk about how they will never go to a fully automated graded system, which I kind of tend to agree with, um, especially when it comes to vintage. Uh, him and Poke Knowledge talk a little bit about the feel and the smell of a card and things like that. There are some aspects of, of, of vintage that, uh, and, and some aspects of just cards in general um, that still require a human touch, a human verification. Um, and uh, I, I, I agree with that. I, I, I think that there is a happy median, um, a hybrid grading approach, if you will, uh, to, to grading and to the way things should be done in terms of uh, finding that balance between system automated grading and then human interaction and verification. Um, and, and he seems that it seems that PSA is kind of headed in that direction. Now, I apologize for the long video, but I really felt this was important. So this last comment uh, was about um, LIFO, for those of you who are in uh, operation industries and, and warehousing and logistics, you guys understand what LIFO. LIFO is last in, first out, uh, or first in, first out. Um, it's sort of just a way that you manage orders. And one of my issues with PSA has always been their inconsistency in the way that they receive orders and ultimately ship out orders. Uh, it's not very consistent in terms of, hey, I shipped this order last week and then two months later I shipped in an order, another order, but the my newest order is already in grading and my last order hasn't even made it to verification yet. Like there's all kinds of inconsistencies in the way that that happens. And once again, I applaud Poke Knowledge for asking the question uh, and this was kind of the subsequent discussion. He had a, a question he wanted me to ask you, and I know it's a little spicier one. Why is it sometimes when Spicy we submit questions. cards to PSA, like if we have a submission a week apart, sometimes one of those submissions magically like starts to go through the grading process a little bit faster than the, yeah. week, the one the week before? Is that just an internal thing on your guys? or? There's so many factors. It's hard to explain. I'll try my best, but it's not perfectly first in, first out um, because some orders are bigger than others. People aren't willing to admit this, but sometimes when you submit cards, you have a card, you may not realize it, but that one card is more complicated to grade or more complicated to slab or any part of the process is more complicated. Maybe it's too big, maybe it's too small. And our orders move 
as an order. So when you, it's like a snake, of course, the mouse goes in and it gets digested. It comes out. You can't take out one card. You can't, you know, everything moves with an order. For example, if you have a card that's autographed, guess what? It has to get autograph authenticated. That's a, it's as if it's being graded twice. So there's all these things we call them edge cases, but in reality, almost every order has an edge case. So therefore it's not really an edgy thing, right? It's, it's every order has complexity. You know, some days we can grade smaller card orders, smaller card orders um, faster. Some days we say, you know what, we're going to do, you know, we got behind on 500 card bulk orders. We're going to crank those out this week, right? Um, there's just so much complexity and, and diversity in what people submit. Yeah. And we take it very seriously. So every, like, you know, if a card requires lamination, you know, if it's too small for the, we don't want it moving around the holder that adds, you know, potentially weeks because there's, you know, only so many people that are trained to do that. Um, so that's really the answer. It's, it's kind of an, it depends, but it, you know, we, I get this, like, it's probably my most common complaint, no. but you know, I, I would say 99 out of hundred times when I ask and I look at what the order is, I'm like, oh, well, it's because you have, you know, this one card, you know, and it could just be a standard size card, but guess what? It may have common counterfeit, you know, risk. And, you know, we have an extra set of eyes look at it internally. You know, we have all these flags set up in our system where it's like, oh, you submitted this card, you know, such and such needs to look at this card before it's passed. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So Again, another great, great question by Poke Knowledge. A great answer by Nat Turner as a guy that comes from op, from the operations side of things uh, in my day job and shipping and logistics and, 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 and order processing and order realization. I understand everything that Nat says and I have zero issues with any of that. That is um, a really important thing that people need to be aware of when it comes to the way that you submit your orders. Um, that there might be some complicated cards within your order and you know in order to avoid potential mix-ups even further that whole that whole order has to stay with itself right it has to stay it has to stay together so if you have one card in there that that has to go through that extra verification because a flag popped up of um you know a lot of counterfeits for that particular card and it's in your order of 100 cards well then that whole 100 card order has to move to have those individual cards verified um, uh, additionally verified, right? And and that's just the way that the order has to move. So it was great to see Poke Knowledge ask the, uh, the question and, and great to see uh, Nat answer that. So that, that, that was the last one that I had. At the end of the day, I, I this is a very long video, so I really appreciate you guys if you're still watching. But um, at the end of the day, there was a whole lot of discussion happening in this. It was, again, more Pokemon centered discussion, but it was about a, uh, like an hour long live session. So I, I highly, highly recommend that you guys go back and watch uh, the whole the whole discussion because there was a lot of great points there. These are just a few that I took out that are that I felt were more relevant to the overall grading PSA uh, landscape. Um, but let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Uh, am I over exaggerating this whole comment that he made about grading consistency? Uh, if you think I am, please uh, kind of talk me off the ledge here because I really had a, a set of cards ready to go to PSA. And after watching this interview, I kind of held back. And again, what I look for in a grading company is consistency. And I'm not even going to call it accuracy anymore. I'm going to call it adherence to their published standards. And if those, if that level of adherence can be, you know, is, is, is a sliding scale depending on how fast they need to get things out the door versus, you know, how much work they have in front of them. I have a problem with that. And, um, again, in that aspect, I feel SGC is, is the best grading company that's out there. You can fight me if you want to, but fight me in the comments. Uh, thank you guys for watching. As always, this was a long one. I appreciate you guys that held on. Uh, and we'll catch you guys on the next video. Love y'all. Peace.